For this session, let's start with a quote. It's by Blaise Pascal, the great 17th century French philosopher, and it goes like this. Justice without force is powerless. Force without justice is tyrannical. It's a profound quote, and maybe before going forward, you should pause the video and reflect on it. What is he saying here? And what, what does he mean? And how might you put it into your own words? One way to read this quote is to say that Pascal is revealing the reciprocal relationship between power, or force, and doing good, or justice. He seems to be saying that having one without the other leads to serious problems. In this first case, justice, having, having a sense of equality, or a sense of what is good for everyone, or having a law or a set of guidelines that are deemed ethical and moral, is practically meaningless if there's no power behind it. In other words, without being enforced somehow. In the second case, force, having power, having the ability and resources to enforce something, becomes repressive and authoritarian if it's not guided by a sense of justice. In other words, by some sense of what's right or good. The two biggest drivers of climate change and global warming are the fossil fuel industry and the animal agriculture industry. Both even get subsidies from the government, essentially taxpayer money. And their executives are immensely wealthy and have incredible power. These executives must know that their industries are irreversibly damaging us and the planet. But they remain largely business as usual. Isn't this a concrete example of force without justice? Or here's another example. We just had a former Facebook employee from its Civic Integrity Department testify before the U.S. Congress that the social media giant has prioritized views, advertising, and profits over the safety and moderation of its platform, which has led to everything from fomenting violence in different parts of the world to young people developing body image issues. And the kicker? We know this because of Facebook's own internal research. Isn't this also an example of force without justice? But these thoughts lead to very thorny questions, like, okay, but what is the good? What is it to be moral? And what is justice? Philosophers across culture and history from ancient times to the present, have been mulling over and debating these terms. And we're certainly not going to settle this in this session. But I think it's important to start with Pascal's insight because it says something about the relationship between art and power. Art history is filled with powerful and often select people who have been able to shape tastes. Throughout most of history, it hasn't been artists who have had the first or even final word on what art is. It has been political rulers and the elite strata of society. Even though artists have far more freedom today, this dynamic of art and power is still true in so many ways. So for example, if you're someone who's never really liked or appreciated art or history, ask yourself, what forces in society have made you think that these subjects are not important? Or literature, or philosophy? What are the power relations in our everyday lives that guide us towards certain things and not others. In all likelihood today, this power to shape public taste and opinion is run by a complex computer algorithm, which means not by a king or a government ruler, but by the wealthy and elite sectors of our society. So all this to say is that power doesn't only affect art, but it affects all of us. And so in this session, we're going to look at the role of power in art in three different, though really quite related ways. First, we're going to see how art conveys the law and even reinforces it. Ideally, laws are connected to ideas of justice, which will have us return to Pascal's quote that we just started with. Second, we're going to see how art exuded political power. In other words, how powerful forces in society have used art to keep populations obedient and under control, and sometimes quite literally. Third, we're going to see how art has been used as cultural leverage. And by this, I mean the use of art and culture as a way of reinforcing political prestige and legitimacy. In this last section, we're even going to see some examples where art was used as a political weapon. In other words, as propaganda. 
To analyze these three relationships between art and power, we need to be equipped with an important term for this session, patronage. Patronage is the act of commissioning and funding a work of art. So the person who has the power and the means to do this, like a king, an emperor, or a wealthy private citizen, is called a patron. Patronage is incredibly important to study in the history of art. And as we'll see, uh, and we're going to see how patrons play a major role in shaping uh, art history. And so here's a contemporary example of patronage, just to get us started. You'll remember the painter Julie Marutu from last session. One of her major works, called Mural from 2010, was commissioned by Goldman Sachs three years before uh, for the lobby of their New York headquarters. It was commissioned for $5 million. And the fact that it was commissioned in 2007, right at the start of the financial meltdown, which Goldman Sachs played a big role in, is interesting to note. But this is just one example. There are countless examples of wealthy patrons in art history. In Florence during the Renaissance, the Medici family were huge patrons of art. And incidentally, they were also bankers. Power and wealth often goes hand in hand with the creation of art. Okay, so let's begin with the law, which in the broadest sense is a set of rules that dictate how individuals should act in the public sphere. These laws can be imposed from above, as in dictatorships, or they can be, they can be agreed upon by the members of society, as in a democracy. One of the oldest written legal documents is actually not on paper, but carved in a black basalt sculpture. This is the Stele of Hammurabi. Hammurabi was the king of Babylon, a, Mes a Mesopotamian city in present-day Iraq, from 1792 to 1750 before the Common Era. He turned the city in into a major power center of the region and commanded what was largely agricultural lands and communities. Part of lording over this vast region was settling disputes and administrating different peoples who shared a common language. And this is where the law comes in. But first, what is a stele? A stele is a carved stone slab that's placed upright and like this one often has writing on it. I like to think that Stanley Kubrick was inspired by this stele for his monolith in his film 2001 A Space Odyssey. This stele of Hammurabi was found only in 1901 in Iran by a French excavation team. And so let's take a look at the top sculptural section of the stele and then the bottom three-fourths that contains the inscriptions. The top carving relief features two figures, Hammurabi himself on the left and the sun god Shamash on the right. If we zoom in, we see king and god eye level with each other, which already says something about Hammurabi's power. The king actually might be a touch higher than Shamash in the composition, though of course the god is seated and visually inferred to be much taller than Hammurabi. If you think about it, it's an amazing visual trick by whoever the sculptor was. Because how do you show the king next to a god without dim diminishing either one? Well, the solution is to have the much bigger Shamash seated and Hammurabi standing a hair above him. And this composition isn't arbitrary. It's actually the main point of the work. Namely, that Hammurabi is king because of Shamash's permission and will. And this is incredibly important in the relationship of, uh, in, the, in the history of human politics. And we have a term for it. And that term is divine rule. This is the idea that royalty is legit legitimated by a god and that the king is only answerable to this god. We can see this power relation throughout history and across different cultures and religions. Here, the artist has emphasized this relationship of power between human ruler and god. Shamash is wearing a crown, uh, uh, a horn crown which in Mesopotamia symbolized godliness. Rays of sunlight emanate from his shoulders, and he rests his feet on mountains. And this echoes the actual sun rising above the mountain ridge, uh, but it also evokes size and power. He's giving Hammurabi a rod and a string, which symbolizes power and the ability to rule. These have been interpreted as tools used in livestock, since cattle have rings punctured through their noses and are struck and tamed with rods. 
So, by analogy, Hammurabi leads his people like chattel. Less violently, these symbols have been interpreted to be a rod and a string, which then become objects of measurement. Not only physical measurement, but also measuring fairness in the legal sense. So, for example, if, if you're ever playing a game where distance matters, the only fair way to judge the winner is by precise measurement, rather than simply eyeballing it. It's not surprising to learn, then, that Shamash is not only the sun god, but also the god of justice. And so this brings us to the bottom part of the stele and the textual inscriptions, which, yeah, they might be less visually interesting, but they're actually fascinating in what they say. You can think of this, of this stele as a legal document and a, set of, and a set of laws, like the Ten Commandments from the Old Testament, and so many other scriptural texts in world religion that tell, that tell the faithful what their codes of conduct should be in life. A good 20% of the text reminds everyone that Hammurabi is a righteous ruler legitimized by a divine power. And unlike our constitution, which has been and can be amended in the future, this duly tells everyone that these laws are fixed for all time. It's said that Hammurabi was really invested in, in applying his laws to even the most minor disputes. And the, the inscriptions are all in cuneiform, wedge-shaped symbols that were used by Mesopotamian societies at this time. And other than praising the king, uh, who often laid down the many rules of, 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 of the land, there are many other uh, different laws. And here are just a few. <laughs> so here's one. If a house falls on someone and it was the builder's fault, the builder will be severely punished, even by death. Here's another. If a wife has been caught cheating, she'll be strangled and thrown into water. And this is just one of the many misogynist and patriarchal laws that involve throwing women into water and killing them. If a son, here's another one, if a son hits his father, the son's hand will be cut off. So basically, these are three of hundreds of laws, but basically the laws settle disputes with a tooth for a tooth um, and an eye for an eye. And that exact wording is found in Hammurabi's laws many centuries before the more famous eye for an eye Jewish commandment, and this is another example of syncretism. In many ways, this is a model of justice as retribution or revenge, a model that our legal system in this country still upholds in certain ways, as in those states that still practice capital punishment, putting people to death. It should also be noted that punishments could be different according to Babylonian social class, the more wealthy and important being persecuted less harshly than the poor and those deemed less socially important. And again, we might be able to find examples of this today in our own country and in our legal system uh, of unfairness according to social class and other, uh, and other, and other things. Let's look at another example of an artwork having to do with the law. We're in Italy now, on the cusp of the Renaissance in the 14th century. Specifically, we're in the city-state of Siena and the Palazzo Publico, where government officials would meet, including the, the, the mayor. In 1338, the Common Era, the painter Ambrogio Lorenzetti was commissioned to decorate a large meeting room with frescoes. And a fresco is a wall painting, and it comes in two different versions. Buono fresco, or true fresco, which means the paint was applied to wet plaster that had been prepared on the wall. And fresco secco, or dry fresco, in which the plaster was dry when the, paint was, uh, when the painting was started. Siena, like Florence, was a city republic, which means it broke away from the feudal rule of aristocrats, dukes, and kings. This commission lent prestige and power to this republic and its civic leaders. And it's no coincidence that the room for which these frescoes were commissioned was the hall where the nine magistrates, or judges, of the city would meet to deliberate. And one of these frescoes is called The Effects of Good Government in the City and the Country. And in some ways the title really says it all. Lorenzetti is giving us a view of Siena as a happy, peaceful, and productive urban place. People are dancing and singing. Citizens are buying and trading their goods. There's even a religious pilgrimage passing safely through the city. 
Its colorful buildings, which seem to be jutting out in different directions and perspectives, all still seem unified. And it's a thriving community and one that's still under construction and forward looking. So notice at the far center right, the builders working on a rooftop on a new building. This was still a time of separate city states in Italy. It wasn't a unified country yet. And often different city states would threaten each other. So this fresco also emphasizes the security of this urban space by calling attention to the walled fortification on the right. Really everything about this painting exudes community and trust built on the rules and laws of the Sienese government. And I think, you, I think you can see how fitting it is that it appears in the magistrate's hall, the very place where the rules and laws of the city being pictured were enacted and enforced. This is a clear example of art playing the messenger to the law. Now, let's switch gears a little bit and look at some objects that are simply imposing in their sheer presence. They exude political power itself in various ways. And the most the fitting place to start is all the way back in Egypt during what's called the Old Kingdom, which lasted from 2686 to 2160 before the Common Era, so nearly 5,000 years ago. It's during this time that some of the most celebrated structures in architectural history were built, which you'll even find on the US $1 bill with an all-seeing eye at the top. And I'm curious, what do you think about this? Why, why is this? And of course, I'm speaking of the Great Pyramids of Giza. If the Babylonian king Hammurabi wanted to convey his eternal rule through his stele and laws, these massive constructions seem to convey eternity and immovability itself. If there's a design or a shape that looks permanent and monumental, it's the three-dimensional triangle that rests firmly on the ground with its four corners and top that points straight up into the sky. Architecture is always a negotiation between earth and sky. There are three main pyramids built at different times for three specific and powerful pharaohs who ruled during the fourth dynasty of the Egyptian Old Kingdom. Khufu, Khufu Khafre, and Menkare. The much smaller pyramids you're seeing, uh, near the big ones, were built for their respective queens. The biggest pyramid is Khufu's, which is sometimes called the Great Pyramid, simply the Great Pyramid. Scholars continue to debate how exactly these Egyptians were able to build these massive pyramids, just to give you a sense of the job. Khufu's pyramid is almost 500 feet tall and made of approximately 2,300,000 blocks of stone that weigh two and a half tons each. And originally, the pyramids would have been covered by fine white limestone, but over time, this was worn away and used for other building projects. I mean, can you just imagine the labor force that was needed for these pyramids? How many nameless human beings, and non-human beings like bulls, toiled on their construction? And how many likely perished over the course of their building? We might think this is a thing of the past, but even during our own time, this can be a pressing issue. For example, every four years, sports tournaments like the FIFA World Cup and the Olympics construct stadiums in various cities, which often lead to labor casualties and deaths. And so for the, for the upcoming World Cup in Qatar, it's estimated there have been 6,500 deaths during stadium construction. If scholars still debate their, their construction, what we know for sure is that these pyramids were funerary complexes. In other, word, in other words, burial sites for these rulers. The, tomb, the tombs were located in the heart of the pyramid at its very center in what's called the King's Chamber. The pyramids hope to assure safe passage for Khufu, Khafre, and Menkare through the underworld and the afterlife, which included the ritual practice of mummification. Often, the pyramids and their surrounding structures included the material goods of the ruler. One even includes a boat, a whole boat, to navigate the afterlife. And this is a recurring theme in the burial sites of various rulers across cultures and across histories, where it seems they thought they could take their wealth with them after they passed away. And if the pyramid is the symbol of religious and political power in ancient Egypt, I think our symbols of power today, architecturally speaking, are skyscrapers, which embody the political power of international global capitalism. One of the key architects for the development of the modern skyscraper was Mies van der Rohe. His was a minimalist architecture of less is more, 
with little ornamentation and a sleek functional style and it's called the international style. The only visual embellishment uh, in this building, his Seagram building, which he built with another celebrated architect, Philip Johnson, are the bronze columns on the outside, which exude luxury. And you can see this building the next time you walk down Park Avenue in Midtown Manhattan. And the next time you do, I want you to ask yourself something. How does this structure make you feel? How does it have power over you? Is it overwhelming? Is it alienating? Does it make you, f make you feel small? Or maybe it's exhilarating. What do such buildings do to your experience of the city? These are all really interesting questions. And so now let's consider a few more works that exude political might in similar ways. And there's an incredible story. In 1974, a few brothers in Xinjiang, a village in China, were digging a well. They discovered more than water, though. What they found had been buried for well over 2,000 years, going back to the earliest period of Chinese unification. In fact, they had accidentally made a major discovery, a whole necropolis, that's the tomb or mausoleum of the first emperor of Qin. If we go back to 450 before the Common Era, China was not a unified state. It was made up of a number of different dynasties that were at war with each other at the time. This was the Warring States period, which lasted under, until uh, 256 before the Common Era. In 220, 221 before the Common Era, the Qin Dynasty conquered all the others and unified China. The first emperor of Qin led the way and was an efficient and probably ruthless leader. Aside, for, aside from surviving a number of assassination attempts and obsessing over finding a potion to become immortal, he ruled according to a strict political philosophy called legalism. He burned books from other cultures and dynasties and consolidated the administrative power of China. It's also during his rule that the Great Wall of China began construction. But probably the work of art most associated with him is this mausoleum with these life-size soldiers. There are thousands of them, a whole army. And this is only part of the mausoleum that's been discovered through excavations. It's said that there's a whole recreation of his temple in there somewhere too. Uh, and if he tried to take, as if he tried to take his whole court with him into the afterlife. The soldiers are made of terracotta, which is a type of red clay. They all face away from the emperor's burial mound, forever protecting him and his realm. What's incredible is that these soldiers are all different from one another. The artisans who made them had a whole assembly line of terracotta parts, arms, legs, torsos, armor, gear, hand, hair, you name it. Then they mixed and matched these standardized parts to create unique soldiers, along with horses, chariots, and weapons. It was really an incredible find, just in 1974. But we can't have a class on the topic of power without mentioning the Roman Empire. And if we just met the first emperor of Qin, here is the first emperor of Rome, Augustus. Like Florence and Siena, the cities who were inspired by it, Rome began as a republic. But after a period of civil war and the assassination of Julius Caesar in 44 before the Common Era, his grandnephew and adopted son Octavian defeated Mark Antony and Cleopatra in Egypt, and Octavian became, became Augustus in 27 before the Common Era. Augustus, Augustus ushered in a long period of peace called the Pax Romana, which brought much cultural and artistic development, including this marble statue, a copy of an original bronze. Here we see Augustus as a god. At his right leg is the figure of Cupid riding a dolphin, and as the son of Venus, this Cupid figure reinforces not only Augustus's godliness, but also his divine rule as Roman emperor. This statue is highly idealized. Augustus was actually 70 years old at this point, and so the artist clearly made him to look much younger and muscular. And one of the key features of this work is the emperor's breastplate. When we zoom in, we see a number of interlocking elements. At the bottom is a diplomatic ceremony of a Roman soldier receiving a legionary standard which identifies the Roman army. And this relates to Augustus's victory over the Parthians, an empire in, uh, in, in present-day Iran. The sky god, Caelus, is presiding over the scene uh, at the top of the breastplate, 
as are Apollo, Diana, and other Greco-Roman gods throughout. And on his epaulets, the, on, on his shoulders, appear two sphinxes, which symbolize Augustus's, Augustus's victory over Egypt. With this plaque that you're seeing now, we return to Benin City, before it was pillaged by the British Punitive Exhibition of 1897. Benin City is in present-day Nigeria. Last session I may have been confusing, so please note that present-day Benin is a different country that sits just next to Nigeria. This palace plaque shows the warriors and attendants who serve the Oba, or king. This brass sculpture is in very high relief, which means the, figure the figures really stand out, they really pop out. The figures also fire, uh, follow hierarchical scale, with the warrior chief as the largest and therefore most important figure in the center. He holds a spear and an ebon sword, which is a leaf or fan-shaped weapon that lends him distinction. Both the armor, the dress, and background designs are beautifully ornate. And the background patterns are these petals and flowers that float on water, which reference the water, the water deity Olakun in Yoruba mythology. Often these plaques would have been displayed at the court and would double the power and protection of actual soldiers and attendants to the Oba or the king. All three of these works, the mausoleum of the first emperor of Qin, the statue of Augustus, and this palace plaque exude and convey political power. But they also use art as cultural leverage. By this I mean they employ artists to make objects that not, on, not only attest to their power, but also legitimize this power by aligning it, aligning it with the prestige of culture, learning, and beauty. Recall our first example from this session, Goldman Sachs commissioning a major painting for their corporate headquarters. That's a great example of using art for prestige, and likely tax breaks at the end of the fiscal year. In other words, rulers in history have not only ruled through sheer force, they have also used seductive objects and visuals. And here's where we get back to that concept of ideology. Art has been used as a means of reinforcing certain ideologies which remember are ideas that we hold in an unquestioned way or in an it's only natural that things are this way kind of way. So, for example, the ideology that kings are kings because gods say so, which has, has remained unquestioned for a long period of time, is ideological. Today, it's less often art that's used to legi legitimize political power, but more often visual culture more broadly, especially advertising and consumer products. There are even some thinkers in the 20th century who argue that the goodies we desire and buy, from food to video games to makeup to iPhones, you name it, actually keep us under control and distracts us from asking the more urgent political questions of our time. And so now we're, we're going to end this session by looking at some artworks that do similar things. They each in their own way Im imply art towards similar ideological ends. Here is the Sun King, the absolute monarch that was Louis XIV in France during the 17th century. Louis XIV was not only the longest ruler, ruling king in history, he was also a major patron of the arts. He moved his court to Versailles, just outside Paris, and the gardens of this palace alone attest to his use of culture and refinement to embolden and legitimize his rule. Along with the imm immaculately groomed grounds, there are fountains and sculptures everywhere, and this is only the outside of Versailles, of his palace. In 1701, the king had Hyacinth Rigaud paint his, pa paint his portrait when he was 63 years old. Yes, this painting definitely exudes power. You have the imposing Roman column in the background, and on the column, on the, on the bottom part, is a representation of Themis, the Greek goddess of justice and the law. You have the crown resting just underneath the king's right hand, and itself rests, and his hand itself rests on his scepter. And you have his ornate sword that he's brandishing from his left side. But it's also a sumptuous painting. In other words, it's really luxurious. All that fur and fabric attests to the king's wealth, refinement, and culture. He's wearing high heel shoes, which at the time were worn by important men, and he seems to be showing off his legs that are dressed in white stockings. Even the paint itself was luxurious. All that purple blue that you're seeing on his long fur, which was made of the mineral lapis lazuli, was even more expensive and valuable than gold at the time. 
uh, but be assured, rest assured, gold is also used in this painting. Louis XIV originally commissioned this for his grandson, who would become King Philip V of Spain. But he liked it so much that he kept it for himself and had a copy made to send him instead. And this, this happened often, where copies of paintings would serve as diplomatic would serve diplomatic relations between states and between rulers. So this painting by Rigaud is a perfect example of art being used for both power and cultural prestige. But then, nearly a century later, art would be used for very different political ends. In fact, in 1789, the monarchy would be deposed by the French Revolution. And important revolutions also happened in the U.S. just before this, and in Haiti just after the French Revolution. This was a time when divine rule came under serious questioning through, a popu through popular uprisings and a desire for representational forms of government. In short, for a republic rather than a monarchy. And the French painter most associated with the French Revolution is Jacques-Louis David. This is his Oath of the Harati, an important painting that was made just four years before the Revolution. David is part of the neoclassical movement in 18th century Europe. This was a time when artists and thinkers looked back to classical Greece and Rome for inspiration and stories that could be updated for present day issues. This painting is a great example of this, since it depicts a story from Roman history. The Horati was a family that lived during the Roman Republic, at a time when it was threatened by another city-state nearby, the city of Alba. In order to decide the war, each city decided to send three brothers to fight it out. So what you're seeing here on the left side of the painting are the chosen brothers of the Horati family who are pledging an oath to their father, who stands just in front of them in the middle with their swords, to go fight for the honor of their city, of Rome. On the right side, the mother, sisters, and wives in the family are weeping, obviously fearing for the life and safety of their sons, brothers, and husbands. All this is set in an almost cold and severe architectural setting with stone tiles and Roman columns and arches in the near background. But there's one, important, one more important wrinkle to this story. The two families involved in this history from, from, from Rome, from Roman history, are actually united by marriage. One of the Horati women on the right of this painting actually married into the Horati family from that other family in Alba while one of the Harati daughters is engaged to one of the brothers in Alba who are, about, who are about to fight her brothers. So it's almost like a soap opera. But the important tension to note in this painting is the conflict between the public and the private, between civic duties and family duties, or to put it, or put it a little bit more simply, between love of country and love of family. And to your eyes, which side of the equation seems to be winning here? It's often interpreted that David is privileging the public, civic duties, and country. In other words, the brothers and their task of defending the Roman Republic. And here is where this ancient story connects to the present-day situations of the French Revolution that, again, was only four years away. Almost everyone at the Paris Salon of 1785, where all the latest paintings would be shown to the public, including this one, would have realized that it spoke that the story in this painting spoke to the revolutionary ambitions of their day. After all, overthrowing the monarchy and founding a new republic takes sacrifice, often personal sacrifice, in the name of country. So this painting was an allegory for the French Revolution. It was an older story up to, updated to tell a newer unfolding story. In fact, David would take part in the French Revolution and would even work as an artist for Robespierre and the revolutionaries the revolutionary leaders of the First French Republic. If Louis XIV was a big patron of the arts, as was the French Revolution, so was the Safid Empire in 15th and 16th centuries in present-day Iran and Central Asia. The rulers and elite circles would get together for art and literary evenings, enjoying poetry and probably what they're most known for, these gorgeous um, Persian miniature paintings, which were commissioned by these rulers and elite circles. And so what you're seeing on screen is widely considered to be the greatest miniature Persian miniature painting, namely the court of Gaimars, 
which is the first page of the epic poem Shanama, a history of Persian mythology and its rulers. Gaimars was the first king at the beginning of time. He was the lord of the world and presided over it on his mountain. He taught the first humans how to eat and how to clothe themselves in leopard skins. And this is all pictured in this delicate and very beautiful page. It was painted with opaque watercolor and gold, maybe even silver too. And the decorative design that frames the page, all those golden specks, were made by flicking the paint with the paintbrush. And the image at the center is just as amazing, probably even more amazing. It too has a, gold, has a background made of gold, and it's teeming with different colors. I get the sense of, of a, like, like a psychedelic feel in this imagery. And in fact, some scholars argue that the practice of smoking opium in the courts influenced the way these paintings looked. Whatever the case may be, if you look closely, you can find nearly an endless amount of visual information. Here's just one cross section of this page. In the foliage and the rock formations, you can find all sorts of different animals, both tame and wild. And this mythological scene of the beginning of time in Persian mythology is actually a lot like Eden from the Old Testament book of Genesis, where there's no violence at all, and all the different animals are paying homage to Gaia Mars by getting along. It's really an incredible work and endlessly fascinating to look at. But there's one other uh, story involving this book that's really fascinating. That's much more, uh, much more during our time. After the Iranian Revolution of, 17, of 1979, some of the art collected by the Shah, who was overthrown by the revolution, could no longer be shown to the newly imposed Islamic laws in the country. One of these was by the abstract expressionist painter Willem de Kooning specifically his woman three that you're seeing on the left there. So what happened was that there was a diplomatic exchange between the U.S. and Iran. Iran got half of this original copy of the Shahnameh, and the U.S. got woman three, which is now in the private collection of a hedge fund manager. It's really an incredible story that shows how art can be caught up in geo geopolitical power. And here's another example of that. When Adolf Hitler and the National Socialists took power in Germany in 1933, which would lead to World War II, the Holocaust, and so much destruction, he and his Nazi party took a keen interest in art and culture. Goebbels, who was the Ministry of Culture, championed filmmaking, and the Nazis often stole art throughout Europe. And actually, still today, their stolen art, stolen Nazi art, is being repatriated in, in lots of different lawsuits. And maybe the most famous example of a stolen painting during that time is Jan van Eyck's Gantalta piece, which we've seen in this class, and that both Hitler and Hermann Göring liked and fought over ownership after they stole it from Belgium. The Nazis even put up an art exhibition. The most notorious is the one you're seeing here, the Degenerate Art Exhibition in Munich from 1937. In it were major works by nearly all the modern art movements, movements of the early 20th century, some of which we have or will study in this class. Fauvism, Cubism, German Expressionism, Dadaism, and so on. These works were deemed to be deviant. The Nazis literally thought that they were bad for people, that this type of experimental art could deform or corrupt people. The exhibition sought to ridicule this art, and so notice all the slogans and graffiti in the space alongside these modern works of art. The Nazis even made disparaging analogies between modern art and the elements in society that they deemed to be unclean and invasive, most notably Jewish people and people with disabilities. Nazism's nefarious ideology wanted to convince the German nation that such people were quote-unquote degenerate, just like the modern art displayed in this exhibition. Thankfully, in 1945, the Nazis were defeated by the Allies. And there's even a famous photograph of U.S. soldiers finding and saving Jan van Eyck's Ghent altarpiece. It's a horrifying but fascinating of art being caught up in military and political struggle and history. And finally, here's a celebrated painting by Jackson Pollock, one of the key painters from the abstract expressionist movement that took off in New York just after World War II. Abstract Expressionism was about using paint to mediate the pure emotions of the painter, without words 
or represent representational images of things in the world. Pollock used the drip technique, which was influenced by Mexican mural painting and indigenous sand painting in the U.S., where he laid the, the canvas flat on the ground, walked around it, and spilled, dripped, and tossed paint without ever actually touching the brush to the surface of the work. He claimed he had complete control over the resulting design, which is pretty fascinating, chaotic, but still somehow composed and unified. But I think what's most amazing about this painting and abstract expressionism as a movement, at least in the context of our session here, is that it was used by the U.S. government and the CIA as a Cold War weapon. So you see, just after World War II, the U.S. was afraid that Europe would become part of the communist state of the Soviet Union. And so part of their pushback plan was to send works by U.S. artists to various museums across Europe. Pollock and the abstract expressionists were interpreted as embodying the principles of individual freedom as opposed to the collective ideals of communism. And so here is one final example of art and culture being used as political tools towards various ideological ends. And it's also a really fascinating history. And so from the end of this session, I hope you, I hope you now see how political power has shaped and continues to shape art and culture. Next time, we'll take a look at artists who have sought to resist the powers that be through their art practices, which we'll see which will see us touching on a number of important issues, not only issues way in the past, but issues that are incredibly urgent for our present and our future.